This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project for the Lib uh, Library of Congress. The veteran's name is James Burnett. He was born September 26, 1923. Um, he was a POW in World War II. Uh, we are recording this on the 21st of February, uh, 2015. My name is Will Hines and I'm conducting this interview, no relation. So, uh, Mr. Burnett, do you just want to get started in kind of telling your, the, where you grew up and um, you grew up in Spartanburg, correct? Yes. And uh, where, did, where did you live in Spartanburg and what did your parents do and that kind of stuff? <clears throat> we lived community Carlisle. North of Spartanburg. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about eight miles out of the city here. And that's grew up on a farm. Uh, and uh, I went to. And what high school did you go to? Bowling Springs High. Bowling Springs? Yeah. Wow. And uh, this is the truth. When I was. Uh, my mother told us, and my birthday is September 26th. That always messed up the school. So it looked like that I started school when I was four, when I was really five. Hmm. See, I was four, the school year started. Within 20 days, I flipped the five, see. But in reality, I started school when I was four. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> but <clears throat> we were in a, a little school back then. Mm -hmm. You had five classes in one room. First row was first. Second, second, third, fourth, fifth. And <clears throat> people ask, how did you move so fast in school? I tell this, but it's really not true. <laughs> the first grade, you were in a row. The second grade, the seat became empty. A few days, it stayed empty, and I just moved over to the second grade. <laughs> So, um, so you, you graduated school really at 17, high school, or, so did you graduate early, or? Uh, I entered college when I was 14. 14? 14. 14. <laughs> I started to this Westland College over near Clemson, Westland College, mm -hmm. when I was 14. Really, it was 15 now. But I was 14 when I started. So your parents were okay with just sending you off and letting you go? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I did okay. Uh, uh, but I didn't really care for college. So <clears throat> I stayed there one year and then I. It's my mother. My dad was up there with him, whatever we wanted to do. But I convinced her I need to come home and go to business school. So I did. I came home and went to business college here. And I went to Robinson's business college for two years. Where is that at? Spartanburg. Was it, what location was the college? Was it like a Wofford that turned into business college? No, no. It was a... Uh, you had... Uh, I think Cecil's business college is probably still around here. But Robinson, I guess one out of business went and walked in alone. But it was located on the main street. There was a hotel, Cleveland Hotel, back then. It's gone now. What's the place where is that? It's down. The hotel was across the street from the newspaper. There was a hotel there. And it was a from, the, from the Herald Journal now? Yes. It was across yeah. the street from there? Yes. It was a hotel. Of course, it's gone now. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> it 
Anyway, you gotta keep me on track. Oh yes, sir. I got you. So you went to Southern Wesleyan for a year. Yeah. You decided to come back and go to the business school when you were 16 at the time. I'm assuming. Yes. And uh, I finished and. When I finished there, I went to work with the Tootsville Railroad. And I stayed with the railroad until I was inducted in the Army. And so you were, you were drafted, so you were sent, and you were drafted in 1943, from what you told me, I, I think. Yeah, so, I, yes sir, so you were drafted in 1943 and you were sent a letter in the mail. What did, what did you feel whenever you got that letter? that you were being drafted, were you? 19, no, I was 19, I was young in 19, I'm half just trying to Oh, yes, sir. You want any water or anything? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take some water here. Okay, well, I'll, I'll end up asking a lot of questions or okay. going back if you're okay with that. Sure, you stop me. All right, well, um, just a question. So you received your letter that you are drafted. Well, how did your parents feel, that kind of stuff? Naturally, you know, they thought I was too young to go off to the Army, and I was. Even though you went to college at 15. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I went to Fort Jackson. Mm -hmm. And the first guy that I saw when I got to Fort Jackson, of course that's the reception center where all inductees. And where is Fort Jackson? Columbia. Okay. And you went in and they interviewed you and these guys would decide where you would fit the army best. And I knew the guy that was doing the interview. He wasn't much older than I was. Uh, and uh, okay, he was kidding me around it. He had an opening in California and this and that. And he said, really, what do you want to do? And I said, that chair there would suit me fine. His chair would suit mm -hmm. me. He, he said, really? Well, come on around. I took that chair and stayed there. From May, when I was inducted, until January. And 44. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never took basic training. <laughs> you know, it just I just maneuvered around to where I was able to stay there. But then he and I both could see that the war was the way it was going. It, we were not going to be able to stay that long because they needed soldiers in the field. So, <clears throat> before I went into the Army, I tried to enlist in the Air Force. But uh, I didn't get in. It was too. They were moving too fast and I didn't get in there. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> he was, I, I'm going to forget about him. I left Fort Jackson and they accepted me then for the Air Force. Hmm. So I transferred from the Army to the Air Force when I left there. In January of 44. And they sent me to Miami Beach. Not a bad place to go in January. Waiting for an assignment to open for me to take um, pilot training in the Air Force. And I stayed in a hotel on Miami Beach for three months. And then Stuff wasn't moving fast, so they were trans. Uh, uh, they transferred me from there to Columbus, Ohio, and put me in a bombardier school, which you had to train for that 
somewhere down the line. Anyway, so they were skipping in. Some things were being put before others, so. I went to Bummerdeer School there. And then, September, now I'm stopping a minute, and then you go back and pick up what you want. Okay. In September, they transferred me from the Air Force to the Army, and that's when I picked up the 106th Infantry Division. In oh, September 44. 44. And so you were probably sent to a replacement depot, or? I was sent to Camp Atterbury, Indiana, for, to be reassigned somewhere. That was in the center for where they put you to reassignment, for reassignments. Okay. And, uh, I had to have no basic training. How did, how did you get in skip basic training? Did they just not well, check your records or? Well, I just, uh, I was able to, move records around where they want them to be available. I was not trying to make a career of the Army, I was trying to get out of it. Mm -hmm. So, the, um, we went to Camp Atterbury, Indiana, <clears throat> and uh, I remember they were telling me I was going to be in Company C. And they told me to go to the Supply with me, draw arms. Let's go and get your rifle. Well, do you know what a BAR is? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what they assigned me. <laughs> Aren't those things really heavy? I mean, just bulky and. I could not get it. I think by myself. So, they had everybody go to the parade field and spread just half of your tent that you shared with another guy, your tent, and disassemble arms. Well, all I could do is lay that big thing down. I'd never seen one. And the sergeant came along and all he was livid. He didn't like this Air Force coming in on him anyway. Because you were in the Air Force. I was. I was for a little, force. for a few months, for yes. three, four months. And he, he would, all of the infantry were didn't like that Air Force company and they thought they had a gravy train, which threw it to you. Uh, <clears throat> so you're, you're sitting down to disassemble arms. Now, do you think you could have disassembled a M1 Grand, even without the basic training? On the M1, yeah, it's very much too bad. Okay. But uh, finally he was convinced that I didn't know what I was doing. He sent me back to the company and to me report to the office there. And I went back and talked to Captain. And he, we finally understood where I'd been. And he said, we just have to work out something here. And he set it up where I could keep working with my transfer to the Air Force back again, but going in as a pilot training, <clears throat> going back to the Air Force mm -hmm. as a pilot trainer. And well, we stayed there three months, about. Then I was transferred, that whole outfit was transferred to New York. You said Newark? New York. Oh, New York, okay. Uh, it's just a, a base run, right off of Manhattan there, really. And we stayed there 
two weeks. It was put on the ship to go overseas. Uh, wh well, why did you not transfer to the Air Force, back to the Air Force, Air Force pilot training? They couldn't get things done quick enough. They, and they were moving, they needed soldiers on the front, and they were moving everybody that could walk to the front. And were you still carrying the BAR? No, no. Okay, so you had switched to a grander. Uh, and I didn't get that till we got old Caesar heading to the front lines. <sighs> yeah, never did fire. Wow. But, uh... <clears throat> so you're, um... You go to New York. Go to New York. And you... Put on what, a ship. Do you know what ship you took over? The Queen? Aquitania. The Aqu Aquitania. Okay. Aquitania, yep. Yep. And we shot about seven days and landed. <clears throat> and... Did you ever notice that y'all would have to do a zigzag yeah, pattern? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I didn't get seasick. Hmm. Did you sleep in cramped bunks that yes. were, yeah. you know, this far away from your face? Yeah, we did. It was, it was really cramped. Hmm. But I always and that food. Oh my gosh, that food on that ship! You can awful? imagine it was. Seemed like they had probably fourteen thousand soldiers on that ship. So it was, and the food, you know what you got. But it's, if you had money, you could get what you wanted. And so I ate steak every night, and everybody else did it, had the money to do it. So I wasn't doing anything anybody else wasn't doing. But we landed in. Uh, about 60 miles out of London. And we stayed there long enough for me to get a pass to get into London. And then... And what did you go do in London? Just, just tour the city? Yeah. And then we were put on a uh, ship to the coast and across the English Channel and then put on the trucks and carry it all the way to the German front. So you you had to drive across most of France yeah, in those yeah. trucks. France and Belgium. And those those trucks cold. are uncomfortable, aren't they? Oh the, sitting God, in the yeah. back just bouncing up and down. And it was cold, terribly cold. And uh, did you have heavy winter gear? Had we had winter gear. Or winter gear, as in, did you oh, have yeah, good yeah, winter yeah. gear? Oh, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Because I know a lot of troops at the front. And that's their fault. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you could, when I say it's their fault, but no, everybody didn't have the access that I had to where I had the right gear. Mm -hmm. Everybody could walk in the supply room and get what they wanted. You see what I'm saying? And I, well, I was in that position. So I was fine as far as clothing. I probably run by whatever you were trying to ask. So why don't you? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll... I'm up now where we own trucks going to the front lines. Okay. And I'll, I'll start going back and asking questions. So. You stayed in England for, you said, you were there Two long months. enough to go to, okay. Two months. And you did just some training there, and did you meet any of the civilians? Did you? Oh, yeah, 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 we stayed in the little, the towns were not big enough to put a, a big group of soldiers, so uh, I think my company, which is about 250 men, was only in this little a town, I guess you would call it. Mm -hmm. And others were placed different places. And so you, you did And I stayed in an old castle. Did you? No, uh, my barracks was in an old castle. Some of the guys that was there were in Quonset Hut type things that the army had put up. Well, they put you up in a castle. How'd you get that? Well, I just, you know, 
and was always out front, staying ahead, seeing what was going on, and kind of asked for it, and we could get it. Nice. So you, you didn't even have a weapon yet until you got into France. True. Wow. Um, so you, you went through London, sightseeing, that kind of stuff, and then you boarded a, um, a transport ship across the English Channel. Yeah, right. And that that's only like a, what, a three or four hour boat ride? Well, I guess to there where you... There were so many ships in that channel trying to dock. Hmm. We tried to dock one place, and then another, and then we finally docked at La Harp, I believe it was, before they had a berth that would handle that ship. Okay. And, uh, and then we went over the side of the ship on these ropes. Oh, on the ropes. I've heard those are scary to climb down. Yeah. Going down to get in a little boat to mm -hmm. get you under shore. Well, because the, both boats are rocking. Yeah. I was, uh, you no, know, that was another time. Yeah. That, that was in Sweden. I won't break it. <laughs> Julie and I were in a, we were in Mexico, and we were transferring from a larger vessel to a smaller vessel to go to shore. And they're rough. The, the things had gotten, the, the weather had gotten rough. Mm -hmm. And we were just about to step on this little game plane, tying the two vessels together. And we were probably pretty close to fixing to walk the plank and damn, she was separated, fell in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Those people fell in the ocean who was on the plane? Mm -hmm. But nobody. No one got hurt. No, I was her drown because I can't swim, myself can't swim. Oh. Wow. But anyway, that happened in Sevilla and that was <laughs> in the army. So, you're, you land in France and it's no, is it November or December now? I think, I think you said it was November. I believe it is November. So it's probably, you know, it's probably pretty cold. No, it ain't gotten cold, yes. Mm. Oh God, we were like the frogs in, mm. in the back of those trucks by the time we got to the front because we were in those trucks at least seven days. Mm. Getting to the front and of course. Riding for hours a day just. Uh, how did you pass the time? I mean, that had to have been freezing back there. Just waiting, waiting, waiting. Mm. And were you were you getting anxious, nervous going up to the front? Were you were you thinking about what was about to happen, or were you just kind of there? No, I don't think at that age. That didn't bother me, and a lot of it did not. Didn't see anybody overwhelmed that they were going to the front lines. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't think anything would ever happen to me. I I've, that's what a lot of veterans have told me that you know they're young yeah. and they just don't think anything's going to happen. They know they're going to be okay, but the next guy might have problems. But they know they yeah. themselves are yeah. going to be okay. No, that didn't bother me at all. Wow. So, riding up, bouncing on those roads and those trucks, freezing cold, <clears throat> and you get, you get to the drop-off point, and you hop out. Is it nighttime, day, and it, well, God, I can't remember. if you can't remember, it's all right. That was a pretty specific question. You can only get so far with the trucks to that front line because there was some water before you could get to where the perimeters you were going to be. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, we got off there, and I guess I was probably about 30 days on that front line, replacing the 2nd Infantry Division. Okay, so you get off the trucks, you, you get your your M1, yes, and you walk to the front lines, and what is it, 
what does it kind of look like on those front lines? Did you just immediately get in a foxhole? Did you have to dig a foxhole? No, there was one deep there. But I started digging it deeper. Really, could, I did. <laughs> could you tell that the you know the trees were just torn up with shells and could you no, see not, battle scars? No, not too much where we were. Because that was just a a holding line that uh, the Americans had put this line in there and held it back. I've got some. Or, and you're in the Ardennes forest, correct? Yes. And had the Battle of the Bulge already started? Were they just throwing as many troops as they could up the front line, or had it had the Germans attacked yet? No, they had not attacked yet. Okay, so that was just circumstances that. Yes. They started attacking on the, I think that they started hitting my position about the 12th of December. Yes. Okay, because it does say you were captured December 19th. So um, they broke through the, the first line. You, you said you were in a holding position, so more of a second line of defense. Yes. So they broke through the front line. And what are you, you're hearing all of the action, you're... Mm -hmm. And what were, you, what were you thinking? Well, now that you were getting... You had to, waiting and looking and seeing what was going to happen. And, mm -hmm. and was it snowing at the time? Yes. Snow was deep. So oh, right. snowing and, and you're hearing these explosions. Or do you start um, being shelled? Are you being shelled from German artillery? Yes. Uh, mm. One of the captains in my outfit, he and I were standing as close as we get to that door. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, see that shell that the Germans are using was, what the hell was it? The 88s? It may have been an 88, but he caught one right in his head. Oh. Killed him immediately. That's as close to really seeing somebody black that I encountered. Mm. And so that was and that was early on, that was yes, at the start. Just about. And so the Germans break through and do you see, you know, our panzers coming at you, what describe kind of what happened. Well, you couldn't just, you know there's a ravine. Let's say here's a hill and here's a ring and mm -hmm. a hill what they would cross this ravine over here and we were back here. So you had a safety of the ravine, yes. which was nice. And they would shoot everything they had at us, and we'd do the same back to them. For days there, several days. And then uh, they told us we needed to pull back. Retreat. They didn't say retreat, pull back. Mm -hmm. All we did was retreat. So, sorry to go back, but so you spent about a few days just across each other, the Germans on the other side just firing at each other? Yes. And you, But you never had to fire your M1? No, it wasn't that much good. They were. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't hit them across that. Didn't care far enough. I didn't get that close to any time mm -hmm. with any German. Okay. It was affected with an M1. Yeah. So you're you're told you need to pull back, and what happens from there? We started pulling back, and then I remember. We started pulling back. Seven o'clock, maybe at night, and then we stopped in a patch of pine trees uh, to get a break. And those bastards went off and left me the next morning. What? They did. They just I, I went to sleep, and they um, they started the moving and. They didn't wake you up? Nobody didn't wake me. But in a short while, gunfire started. And I knew what had happened. And, oh, they were shooting these trees. They'd shoot around and hit the damn pine tree, and it would just fly 
everywhere around you. But you were one of the, you were probably the only one left there, I was. correct? I was. So why were they shooting? Just because they thought people may have been over yeah, there? Yeah, the German was on the hill side. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had tanks. They were not firing in ones. I said I had that M1, but I couldn't. Right. I couldn't reach them with it. Um, so I started to walk it out, and it was an open field. Only way I could go was across the open field. That's the way they went, but they went just before it got daylight. I mean, it was already daylight. Yeah. And uh, of course, the Germans started shooting at me. While you're running across the field. Yeah. And then I just had to stop and surrender to them. But half of the outfit that had left me there, they'd already caught them and they'd already surrendered. Wow. So you're left and you're alone. Mm -hmm. And I bet that was probably the most, that was the most intense. Oh. Yeah, well, it wasn't scary. <sighs> I would have been scared to death. No, we wouldn't. I would too. <laughs> no. It's just, I don't know. And, and seeing these Germans, oh my God, these, these soldiers were, some of them, their rifles were, hang the rifle on the shoulder and the butt of the rifle would just better be off the ground. It was kids. Mm. And, you never know what. Yeah, they were, they were 14 year olds, 13 year olds oh, fighting yeah. at the front. Yeah. So, anyway, that's when I was captured. And so, how, how big is this open field? I'm kind of picturing like a football field, but was it smaller? Or I'm always bigger than a football field. And so, there's snow everywhere, so you're having to trudge through this field, but you're running. And did you just throw your weapon down and run, or did you? I turned and stuck it in the ground, rifle, right my barrel first, or they couldn't use it. I just stuck it in the ground, started walking up the hill toward them, and they were just almost like me, I think. They didn't know what to do. I didn't know what the hell they were going to do, and I walked all the way up to the tank. There was just one tank there and then a few soldiers around him. And were they just pointing their weapons at you and... No, they weren't pointing any weapons because they knew that, uh, well, of course I put my hands up mm -hmm. and they knew that I had not uh, what they knew I was surrendering. That's one thing you didn't do, kill a man while he's surrendering or nothing mm -hmm. like that. You, you didn't, I didn't see anything like that. Could you hear bullets going past you when you were trying to run and that's when you realized that you needed to surrender? Oh, yeah. Oh. I knew I needed to do something when I woke up and those bullets were coming in those pine trees. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a small bullet. Yeah. So you walk up to the tank and, and surrender. And could any of the Germans speak English at all or no? No, not yet. And uh, of course I could see other, our troops they had already surrendered and they just had those guys standing or sitting. And uh, pretty soon they started walking us out. Uh, now, what do you need? Hmm? You oh, need, so. You want me to keep talking or you? No, no, sir. I can start asking some questions. So. At this point, were you still extremely cold? Is snow still up to your oh, yeah, yeah, knees? Yeah. And uh, right now, let me back up. <clears throat> I felt that I was really going to get to go to Paris when we broke out of there, and I dressed accordingly. Uh, we we had. Uh, a dress uniform on the front lines there with us. And, uh, well, everybody had it. Mm -hmm. wasn't just me with it. You had a duffel bag and you had certain things with it. And one of it was a dress uniform. Uh, but I thought that, that I was going to get through that and make that, and I was going to end up in Paris. 
that's was my intention, because we were not that far. I don't know how far we were from Paris. So you wore your nice. I did. I had. Uh, and I was cold and I needed, but I had on thermal underwear and then a, another set of underwear on that. And I had on at least two pair of pants and jackets and shirts. So I was dressed. I had an old coat that I carried with me there. When we were captured, it got hot. Now, you know how cold it's been the last few days. Well, it had been that cold there on that front. And then when we got captured there and we started walking, it got hot. And these crazy soldiers, they get hot, they just take their overcoat off and throw it on the ground. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, really. Did you do that? No. no. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, no, no, I... I toughed it out. And it was good that I did because he, we got into the prison camp. <clears throat> they didn't give us any heat in those barracks. So, my... The uniforms and the clothing that I really carried with me came in handy, helped me to survive it. Mm. So, you you walk out of the Ardennes, and you oh, they put us on trucks. Oh, where we were captured there, we walked. We walked all day, and then we slept that night in a bummed out church. The next day we walked and ended up in a train station. Then we put in boxcars. And I know we stopped one time in Berlin and we the boxcars got bummed that we were in. So you, you saw Berlin. You were in Berlin for... It was in the boxcar. Oh, okay. There was one little hole in one end of that boxcar. And so the either the Americans or the Russians just saw the train and thought it, yes. we should bomb it. Right. But uh, we didn't... We, we had no food from the time we were captured and we were being moved for five to seven days now I know that I got that in some paperwork here how many days we were there mm -hmm. and uh, we were in this on this train and the train we were in boxcars. And it's probably freezing in the boxcars. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, yes, it was freezing. Even though there was 60 men, those boxcars were made to transport 40 men in it. And they crammed 60 men in each of those cars. So you probably, did you have room to sit down? Or did everyone just Everybody stand? couldn't sit down at the same time. True. You, you find a space that you could sit, you grab it, and you sit a while, and then you stand up. And let someone else sit. Yeah. yeah. And that, we, we were in those boxcars for about seven days. <clears throat> no food, no water. How did you not? Well, again, it's that train would stop. The, the German people would slip and help you some by giving certain food to you. Not a whole lot to eat, but they would get some water. Hmm. Um, did you um, did you have any interaction with German soldiers before this? So did could you communicate at all with them, or just did you just did they tell you to go what, somewhere? And you, close enough to them, long enough to 
nothing except now and later when the German guards took to prisoner camp. Yeah, we got to be friends with those guys. Mm -hmm. But, gosh, I guess they were 75 years old, these guys were. The German guards? Yes. So you're, you make it to the prison camp after spending awful, a whole lot of time in the boxcars. You get off at, at the prison camp, or did you get off and take trucks to a prison camp? We got off in a little town, Bad Orb, and it was about a three mile hike to the top of a hill, and there's the camp was on top of that hill. You walked it, you didn't ride up it. It made you walk. And I'm sure y'all hadn't had any food and no, water, we, so it was really we, difficult. Yeah, we were. We were beginning to get in that shit. Oh. It's amazing how far you can go without food and how long you can go without food. Really. So, you go up this road, you get, you get to the prison camp, and you check into the prison camp. So, do they take, do they take down your name, any information to ha know that you're there? Name, serial numbers. That's all you were required to give them. And uh, they kept telling me, I landed in the prison camp that I was going to. I landed there on Christmas Day. <clears throat> December 25th. And they kept telling us we're going to have a great Christmas meal that night. Well, we had a cup of soup made out of our tablet. Made it out of six of a loaf of bread. That was our meal that night. A sixth of a loaf and, a bread. and soup. And that was a wonderful Christmas meal. Oh god. So I guess so you're assigned a barrack or barracks or wherever you were assigned to and did you get a bunk? Did you yes. get Oh did you see that? Mm-hmm. Saw the picture? Yeah. That's what it was there. And so where was this your room or is this just one of the rooms in the prison camp? Yeah. Just a room I don't know who's they all were the same thing. Mm-hmm. And all those beds were iron beds. And yeah, there's three, but well, there was three. I took the top. Mm -hmm. Heat, heat rises. There you go. Smart man. So, and you had a little a straw mattress, which mm -hmm. I guess. Did you, and did you have any blankets at all? Hey, it should wear a blanket. But I had a blanket, I carried a blanket. So you're able to use two. Yeah. They're little blankets they gave you, but you know, gosh, when you freeze to death, that's all you had. Mm. And so, how much how much food were you given every day? In the mornings, uh, you, you, they they said they're giving you coffee. It was nothing but some kind of a water that uh, flavored with something. Mm -hmm. And I used it to shave with. It was further no bite. Yeah. Food to me. And most of them used it for shaving. And then in the afternoon, you got a cup of soup. And a six of a loaf of bread the entire time with that. And that soup started out, had a little meat of some type in it, and one toward the end it ended up with just greens that they pulled out of the fields or anything they could just put in there and make something look like there was some food there. Mm. Did you get really skinny? Did you I lose a lot of weight? I weighed 90 pounds when I was separated. Whoa. Oh. I weighed 138 when I went in. I weighed 90 when I went out five months later. 
<laughs> so you spent you spent about four four months in this prison, correct? In five family. months. Spent five months. Five months. And were you which side of Berlin were you on? The east side of Berlin? Because were you liberated by the Russians or the Americans? The Americans. Germany. I mean Patton's army. Okay. Patton had a son that was in a, a, a barracks close to where we were. So Patton So when he came in, we got liberated a little before the rest of them did. Because his son was there. And you said you had befriended some of the German guards. Could any of them speak English, even though they were, you know, 75 years old then? We learned it. Get words where we knew what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. To some degree, to some degree. Okay. And so, you befriend these German guards, and what did you do during the day? I mean, just lay in your bed, uh, talk, just whatever. Sit. They didn't have any playing cards or anything unless somebody brought them. A deck in his room, you know. He, um, kept control of those things. Mm -hmm. Wasn't a lot to do. Just sitting around and talking. And you said you got cigarettes, but you didn't smoke, so would you trade them for what? Food. If you got, uh, do you know what lemon burger cheese is? I don't. You do. It's nasty. <laughs> Very pungent. And so you got some of that I nasty always, cheese? I always traded for the cheese. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, I don't like taste of it either, but it kept me, kept keeping me alive. Mm-hmm. Hold your nose and, and those guys, eat it. Yeah, they would trade it. I'm, I've seen those guys trade it. A shirt. Didn't have but one. They trade that for cigarettes. Oh my gosh! People would they're addicted to cigarettes. They would they starve to literally starve to death in that camp because they trade their and whatever food they had. They would trade it for cigarettes. So they would starve to death oh, just yeah. just so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so. When the could you did you know the Americans were getting close? Yeah. Before you were liberated. Yeah, yeah, because they were shelling in. Uh, one time the, the the American planes bombed our camp. Mm -hmm. They just made a mistake. It was unintentional. They just made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Killed. I don't know how many. But, I was lucky I didn't get killed either. Mm. Did any German civilians ever come to your camp or and bring food or anything? Never. They didn't have any. They were almost as bad off as we were. They didn't have any food. So, what did the German guards do? Did the German guards just leave whenever the Americans were closer? The old men, they just... They yeah, walked away the night before. Just took off their uniforms and went home? I guess. I don't know. Well, we're not, we were not going to bother those guys. Mm -hmm. We had a chance. They didn't, they didn't bother us. And where they could, they helped. Hmm. But uh, nobody's going to bother those cars. But so, as I say, we were 19, 20 years old. And they were 75. So. Right. So the American troops come in, they bring in food and... Well, uh, I had gotten real sick and had developed pneumonia. And they had one barracks that they that situated. Come on, Jim. Hey. Hey, Jim. That's my grandson, Jim McCleskey. Oh. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Will. Nice to meet you, Will. Jim 
always keeping the books for what, what business we got running still. Mm. Wow. He does that for me on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. He and his dad run, uh, they have. That was the 12 stores where they, they lend money on cars. If you want to buy a car on credit, you see that. Careful what you say, he's reporting you. <laughs> Careful what you say, he's reporting you. Don't you talk bad about him. They'll be seeing this. Don't tell him secrets. <laughs> um, so you had pneumonia. You were put in the bed with um, pneumonia. Right at the very end, I had to sleep on the floor because there's not enough bunk. Bunks with nothing anyway, just... But you know one thing that I still cannot remember to save my life? I slept in that bunk with a man for five months and I don't know who he is, I don't remember who he was. Cool. I have no idea who that man is, or his name. But do you think some of that could be too by the time you left, you were so sick? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go run some errands. Okay, Alright, I'll talk to you guys. Nice to So So they <clears throat> they brought trucks up. I was picked up in a truck. And carried down the hill. There was a landing strip. And do you remember this, or were you just kind of delirious with no, the pneumonia? I remember that. Yeah. Uh, I was carried down the hill to this landing strip, and they had a oh, one of these old planes. That, well, it was a pretty good plane back then, but I was put on a plane and flew to Paris. I just, I got finally got to go to Paris. You dressed up. <laughs> I was flown to Paris. It was just about four months too late. But I hadn't had a bath now. I remember this. And Pajamas five months. Mm. But we were fl f they flew us to Paris. The real bad ones. They flew them. The rest of them, they hauled them out of trucks. Carried them. Good for that. For that. And I was one that they, they flew me to Paris. The whole plane. plane. Mm -hmm. The worst one was flown into Paris and other cities around, I'm sure. Uh, and I think that one thing that I remember such a luxury was to get in a bed, sheets, blankets, after a nice hot bath. That's the luxury. And you still had pneumonia? Yes. And how long did you have pneumonia, or how long did it take you to get better? I, I read in here that they found out you had TB. Uh, yes, I developed TB there from that. I, well, I had to be from that. Yes, it was. We didn't discover that until I was home and discharged from the army, though. So you did you get better from the uh, with the pneumonia? Did that go yeah, away? Yeah, I finally went and got to where we could get medicine. I got better. And did you get to explore Paris any then? No, I was put in that hospital. Probably stayed a week. Then was flown from there to England. Hospitals I went to, and they kept moving us. Uh, and I was in different hospitals, some for treatment, some because they needed the bed there for some, something else. And I finally ended up in, uh, in Scotland, and I was put on a plane and flew to the States from Scotland. Uh, the, really, the sick people got 
transported home by plane. The rest of them came by slow boat. Mm -hmm. So you were still, had you gained much weight back? I don't know, for a while. So you were just in bad shape, yeah, just sick? Yeah, Hmm. Well, I found that. And so you, you flew back to America, um, spend how much time in a hospital? A year at least. Wow. Different hospitals. I was, uh, you may have been thinking I'm leaving now. That you've heard it's red. Mm -hmm. Somehow you finally ended up in Atlanta, in the hospital. You were outside of Atlanta. Yeah, I was sent to Atlanta. When I came from overseas... And didn't they have to stop like a... Um, they stopped in Newfoundland. In Newfoundland because you were so sick mm -hmm. or something. They took me off the plane and yeah. a couple of other guys. I think they thought we were not going to make it any farther. Mm. And we, I stayed in Newfoundland two, two weeks and then put on another plane and sent to Georgia. Wow. So you you barely made it from what I'm hearing. I mean, you were in bad shape. Mm. Yeah, I was in terrible shape. Wow. Been lucky, though. He made it because his little mama was determined he was. <laughs> She, she you won. almost got out of the fighting, and then they just put you in the infantry, didn't they? Oh, yeah, they didn't know it. And Nobody can believe that I could get by with what I did <laughs> and go through it and not go through all the training that I was supposed to go through. <laughs> I can't believe you skipped basic. And in the end, Dr. Colvin is the one. You took Colvin, you took Colvin is the one that really yeah. saved you, helped you, or saved his lungs because they were ready to remove the lung. Mm. That was a hospital in Georgia. So, I mean, really, a lot of your fighting was staying, trying to stay alive in the POW camp and from disease. I mean, you did. You fought in the Battle of the Bulge, but that was just the beginning. Yes. Wow. We were not on the front lines no more than a month at the most. I just, I can't believe you got left. Yeah. That's just the most surprising thing. <laughs> you think your, your friends and soldiers would wake you up. Well, maybe I was somewhere to miss me. <laughs> maybe. You were just a, maybe you were hiding under a sheet and the snow had fallen on the sheet. <laughs> or if you were in your foxhole. You'd <laughs> I'm trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. If you were in your foxhole, you made it so deep, they probably didn't realize you were in there. But, <laughs> I just stayed away from the Germans a little bit longer than the rest of them. Mm hmm that's true, because you said the rest of them got captured, correct? Or just most of them. Did. Well, you took a risk by running across that field. That was, that's an incredible story. Miss Burnett, thank you so much um, for the interview, and thank you, you for your service. Did you get what you wanted to know? Or yes, sir, I did. That was awesome.